A moment ago, I joked about the book of Ruth being better than the Hallmark love stories you watch on TV. All kidding aside, there's a lot of those movies. But it's really just one movie remade a a thousand times if you pay attention to it. Love comes quickly, love comes softly, love comes slowly, love comes in a hurry, love comes, I don't know, when my wife is always watching these, and I'm like, it's the same people, it's the same story. And there's some truth in that. All great love stories are reflections of one central truth, one story. And really, the, the story of Ruth, is po- it's, a, it's a grand tale in an epic story, a love story, a great grand narrative of love that it's pointing us to. When I was a kid, of course, many of you will know this, when you watched shows that were in a series, you had to wait for the next week for the show to come out. Remember those days? Excited, wondering, and waiting for the, my family would gather around the TV, which my sister would change the channel on that little knob by using her toes, laying on her back. We didn't have a remote control in those days. And we had a big green Tupperware bowl of popcorn, and we'd watch whatever the next show was as a family that we were allowed to watch. Now, my kids binge watch. Have you heard of binge watching? They sit down, they hide away in the basement, and they watch an entire series on Netflix in, in you know, one weekend. I don't think that's as much fun. Preaching through the book of Ruth is a little bit like uh, the old days, in a way. Watching a show and waiting for the next episode to come out. And it's very hard as the preacher not to give away the rest of the story every time, every, with every part of the chapter because there's so many good things coming. And maybe you've been binge reading the book of Ruth, which is much better than binge watching Netflix, and that's okay. Let's review. The first half of Ruth chapter 1 is about Naomi. Specifically about Naomi and her husband Elimelech and her sons Malon and Kilion. And they're leaving the land of the promise to go to Moab. Moab becomes synonymous with the place where you leave where God wants you to be. The promised land is the promised land, the place where God's people are supposed to put down roots and stay and trust him. But they leave because of a famine. They go to Moab. And if you know the story, Moab, the Moabites date back to Genesis chapter 19 when Lot has incestuous relationships with his daughters. And that's the history of the Moabites. It's not a good place. Throughout Israel's history, the Moabites and the Israelites had great tension. In fact, Moabite women were viewed as temptresses, seductresses who led Israelite men away into sexual immorality and into idolatry. So going to Moab, you have to ask the question, how bad are things in Israel that you think Moab is a good idea? They go to Moab, and tragedy strikes. Her husband and two sons die. She's left with two daughter-in-laws who are from a foreign nation. Not at all how she thought her life would turn out. One Orpah leaves and goes back to her own land at Naomi's urging, but Ruth, verse 14 of chapter 1, clings to her. And the word cling clung to her is the same word in Genesis chapter 2, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave, you be united to his wife. It's covenant language. She's saying, I'm not going anywhere. In fact, her great statement of faith and commitment in verse 16 and 17 of chapter 1 is, don't ask me to leave. I'm going to go where you go, stay where you stay. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. I'm going to die in your country. Sounds like wedding vows. But I've never heard a mother-in-law or a son-in-law or a father-in-law or daughter-in-law make vows to each other. But they do. The second half of Ruth 1 uh, is about Ruth, her faithfulness, her commitment to Naomi, about their relationship. There is a great deal of tragedy in the first chapter, a lot of darkness, and we get a couple little glimpses or hints of God's goodness and provision along the way. And the chapter, chapter 1 ends in verse 22 with this little glimpse of what's coming. Ruth 1, 22, so Naomi returned And Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Bethlehem means house of bread. You probably heard that last week. They came back to the house of bread when it's time for the harvest of barley. There's going to be bread again in the house of bread. A little hint of what's coming. They, Naomi and Ruth, or Naomi and Elimelech, excuse me, left at a time of famine. Naomi and Ruth return at a time of the harvest. They've got nothing basically but each other. Now you remember that Naomi's not exactly excited about her life. Friends see her when she comes to Bethlehem, remember what she says? They say, Naomi, is this, could this be Naomi? What does she say? Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. So think about Ruth's life. 
I'm leaving my country of origin. I'm leaving my, my family of network of relationships. I'm leaving my religion. I'm leaving my culture. I'm going to a foreign land with a very bitter mother-in-law. <laughs> That's where they are. Let's pick up the story in Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Okay, let me just stop there. We didn't get very far. This will take a long time if I don't pick up the pace. But Boaz, as you know, if you read the story before, is going to become very important. And the writer of Ruth is brilliant. We don't know who wrote this. Hebrew Talmudic tradition says it was the prophet Samuel, but we have no indication. Could have been a man, could have been a woman for all we know. But the writer is a brilliant storyteller. They're introducing a character who comes back later, who's going to be very important. We know he's from the clan of Elimelech. In the, in the Jewish tradition, you had your family, your clan, and your tribe. So he's in the family line, in the clan. There's a relational, a family connection to this man. And he's a worthy man, the text says. Your Bible might say a man of standing. We'll come back to that. Those two details, in the family, in the clan, and a worthy man are going to be very, very important. It's like the writer is saying to us, pay attention to this guy. He's going to matter. He's going to be very important in what God does in this story. You know, when you watch a movie, sometimes you see a character, and you can just tell by the way the, the, the screenwriter does it that this guy's going to be, or this woman's going to be important. That's what's happening here. Okay, where are we? Verse 2. I won't do that for every verse, I promise. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, after him in whose sight I find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. What a coincidence. And he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter. Do not go and glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants." Right away again, Boaz becomes important, and we see him showing up in the story. In verse 2, Ruth and Naomi have no family and no food. They're in need of a people and provision. And Naomi is older, a widow, bitter. Ruth is this determined young woman, and she says, I'm going to go and seek favor in somebody's field. It's the first thing we're going to talk about is seeking favor. Ruth says she's going out to glean in the fields, but not just anywhere, in the field and hopefully in somebody's field who will show me favor, who will look favorably upon me. What does it mean to seek favor? God had established a means of providing for the poor during the harvest season. Landowners were commanded in the Old Testament to leave the edges and corners of their fields unharvested so the poor and destitute could come after the harvest and follow after the harvesters, the reapers, and pick up not only what they dropped or left behind, but the unharvested edges and glean for food. So Naomi says, or Ruth says to Naomi, I'm going to go do this. And hopefully, God willing, I'll find favor, meaning not just the scraps, but someone to take care of us, someone who would look favorably upon me, who would not abuse me. Leviticus Chapter 23, verse 22, one of the two places we see this law. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. 
Now, interestingly, many Near Eastern nations had similar uh, laws about provision, like an ancient welfare system, provision for their own poor. The Hebrew word for the corners or edges or ungleaned land was pesha. It became synonymous with care for the poor or charity. It's like an ancient welfare system. And it was not unusual for other pagan nations to have similar kinds of laws for their own poor. What made Israel's law unique is it says, and the foreigner among you. That was utterly unique. It wasn't unique to care for your own poor, though not everyone did it. But to make a provision for those who were not your people, that was unique. And God follows it up by saying, I am your God. Make room. Care about the foreigner. I am your God. So, Naomi is looking for a man or someone who is obedient to the law of God. I'm going to look for, hopefully I'll be in a field with someone who takes God's word seriously. Who's following God's law and will give her favor favor because she's a foreigner. She's a Moabite woman. If you go through chapter one and two and count up the number of times the author calls her a Moabite woman, a Moabitess, or from Moab, it's astounding. It's so redundant. Like over and over, it's a thread that runs through the story. The point wants to be made. She's not from here. She's not one of us. She's one of them. And yet, we see God's favor. Because this is a risky proposition for Ruth. Later in the story, you heard where where, um, Boaz says, haven't I commanded my men not to touch you? Why would he need to command his men not to touch her unless that was something that went on? It's a risky thing for a foreign woman alone to go into a field. It's at best a 50-50 proposition if she is able to find food or if she is physically or sexually abused, mistreated. That's why she says, I'm seeking favor. Because the opposite could happen. In other words, then and now, not everyone obeys God's law and not everyone treats women alone with kindness and mercy and compassion. She's seeking favor. Now the story gets really good. In verses three and four. Let's read Ruth two, three, and four again. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Hmm. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, who was of the clan of Elimelech, and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. This phrase, and she happened to come, the Hebrew actually says, uh, the construction is something like, she happened to happen. She chanced to chance. We might say, as luck would have it. Like, sometimes when I'm watching those Hallmark movies with my wife, which is rarely, I'm usually reading and she's watching, and I occasionally look up, and something ridiculous happens, like this crazy coincidence where they're going to fall in love, and I roll my eyes and look at my wife and she's crying. You know, it's like, (laughs) come on, this stuff doesn't happen. Actually, it does. It does. She just happened to end up in Boaz's field. And he just happened to be coming back from Bethlehem at that very moment. Like an Old Testament meet cute. I didn't know what that phrase meant. My wife taught me. Do you know what that is? Anybody know? When a couple like bump into each other outside of a store and they end up together. It's like this is what's happening here in the story. The author wants us to go, wait a second. This is no coincidence. As it turned out, of all the fields in this region, she just happens to be in this one at the very time when the man himself is returning. Now here's the spiritual truth I want you to hold on to, not just this morning, but in your life. Nothing happens by accident in God's economy. Nothing happens purely by accident in God's economy. It may feel random, accidental, fate, but it is not so. Nothing is purely random enough to chance with God. The accidents of human history are the activity of God's providence in our lives. We tend to think of God working in history in terms of like when God is working, we think of the miraculous, right? God intervening, we think how? We think something miraculous happens, parting the Red Sea, calming the storm, raising the dead, healing the sick, doing something that's shocking in the world. 
And we see accounts where God sometimes does miraculously intervene. But you know something about the book of Ruth? In all the book of Ruth, there's not one what we would call miracle. Nobody's raised from the dead. No blind people see. No lame people walk. There's no miraculous healing. There's no divine intervention in that sense. But that's not the only way God works. In fact, it's not even the primary way God works in our lives. God also works by his sovereign providential purposes through the average, ordinary, everyday events of your life. You know what Ruth is full of? Ordinary life. Just ordinary life, trying to survive, which is sometimes very hard and even full of tragedy. And one of the things that this author is telling us is that even in the regular stuff of life, God is at work. Even the stuff that seems random, God is not absent. Some of you know this story. Pastor Kevin Engel was a good friend, uh, was on our staff for many years, and then he spent a year with his family in Austria at a refugee camp in Austria. And they were caring for refugees there physically and spiritually. And one of the things Kevin would do, uh, this is before, this is the days of flip phones, he had a digital camera, he would take pictures of uh, refugees and let them see themselves as they're waiting in line to be processed or to get food or clothing and just show them digital photos of themselves because that was a kind of a cool thing for the kids and, and the families, often women without their husbands, many of them fleeing the Balkan Wars and, and from Muslim nations. Anyway, and so one, one afternoon he's on a train ride back to Austria from the camp back to his place in Austria and he sees a man get on the train and Kevin tells the story this way. He had that look about him. I knew he was not Austrian or German. I knew he was a Middle Eastern refugee. Single man gets on the train, sits down next to Kevin. It's fairly crowded. And Kevin thinks, well, maybe it'll comfort him if I just show him some of the photos. He only doesn't speak much of his language, Farsi, but begins to just show him some of the photos on the camera of other refugees. And there, he's flipping through, flipping through with the button, and the man's looking somewhat disinterestedly. And all of a sudden, Kevin hears a gasp. <gasps> my woman, my woman. Kevin goes back. Kevin on his phone has a picture of that man's wife and daughter who he has been searching for throughout Europe. What are the odds that the one man with a digital camera with a photo of that man's wife and daughter would be on the train at the exact minute that man gets on board, looking like a needle in a haystack for his family? They've been separated. I don't remember how long it had been. And just to show you the grace of God, that family, Kevin told the story later, was process to be shipped to another refugee camp the next day he would never have found him nothing happens by accident we don't always get to see it work out like that in our lifetime but if you're a believer in God if you're a Christ follower and you serve the sovereign God of the universe who all things hold together by a word of his power that means all of your life falls under his sovereign control nothing happens by accident or random chance And this is what we see in Ruth. When I read Sinclair Ferguson's commentary on Ruth, he used the analogy of a split screen. You ever watch a movie and there's a split screen where it shows you on one side what's happening, the other side something else happening, and you, you as the observer kind of get the narrator's perspective, oh, I see how this is gonna converge. But you realize they don't know and they don't know what's about to happen. He says that's kind of what's happening here in Ruth. God is showing us in a kind of a split screen way the random events of Naomi and Ruth's, Ruth's life, and God's providential care for them, bringing these things together. So when you cry out to God to do something, God intervene, God do something, do you ever stop to think that he is? You don't see it, you don't maybe experience it or feel it, but he is. Even if you don't see it. How many of you have looked back at your own lives and said, you know, it's no accident we moved here. You know, it's no accident that I met him or I met her. You know, I see now that it's no accident that this relationship went the way that it did, or I took that job, or I went to that school, or we lived on this street. In the time, you're not thinking that way. You're thinking like just going through life. Do you believe that God is divinely ordaining the events of your life today? tomorrow, this week, this year. You believe that? How would your life look if you did? 
Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a man are established by the Lord. In Psalm 16, verse 9, the heart of a man plans his steps, but the Lord establishes his path. Acts 17, 26, Paul, in his speech to the Athenians at the Areopagus, says, he made all men, from one man he made all nations, and established the boundaries and the course of their life. Your life is not an accident. So I, I think it's like the, sto- the, the author of Ruth is saying, come up here for a minute, friends, we the readers, come up here for a minute, and I want to show you God's perspective. You don't always get this in your life, but I want to bring you up here in this story so that you can see, oh, look at this. Look what God is about to do. Do you know at the end of the book of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader in Narnia, how many of you have read The Voyage of the Dawn Treader? Every hand should be going up. I'm, man. There's a reason I keep bringing him up. At the end of the book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the, the children are realizing they're not going to see Aslan again. Aslan's talking to Lucy and to Edmund. And Lucy said, it isn't Narnia, no, sob Lucy, it's you, and we shan't meet you here, and how can we live never seeing you again? But you shall see me, child, said Aslan. Are, are you in our world too, sir, said Edmund? I am, said Aslan, but there I have another name. You must learn to know me by that name. This was the very reason why you were brought to Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you may know me better there. I think there's a, there's a lesson in that statement about how we should read the Bible. Why do you come to the world of the Bible? Why do you read these stories? Purely for information? Memorize facts? Or is it so that in reading the stories that are real stories of the world of the Bible, removed from us, you can get a glimpse of who God is, and in going there, you see him better here. You know him better in your own life. You recognize his activity better in your own life. I think that's part of what Ruth is doing for us. Like the characters in the story, we are involved in the drama of God's unfolding purposes in our lives and in the world. We rarely see in the moment, understand these things. But we're given a picture of the God of the universe who reigns over it all. In fact, these events in Ruth 2 are really God's answer to Naomi's prayer in Ruth 1. Ruth 1 verses 8 and 9 won't be on the screen, but I'll read it for you. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you with her mother, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her, of her husband. She prays a blessing for the God to bless them and be kind to them and be gracious to them. And this is what's happening. The second thing, the man of, God's, the man of favor From Ruth's point of view, she has no idea of the significance of gleaning in this field over any other field. But God is going to do much, much more than she could ask or imagine through this man, Boaz. She's seeking favor, and she finds it in this man. The word I mentioned before, worthy, or if you read the NIV, uh, ESV says worthy, NIV says man of standing. It's the Hebrew word, gibor kail. Gibor, by the way, is the same word used of the mighty men of David in, in his stories. It's used, it's used often translated as hero, champion, man of valor, man of physical military might. Kail often means wealth, significance, and influence. So it's a reference both to his character and his social standing. Here's a person of influence and power in the society and a person of great character. The knight in shining armor, proverbially, who shows up in the story. The first words we hear Boaz speak are to his servants in the field. The Lord be with you. You can tell a lot about somebody by the first words you read about them in the Hebrew Bible. The Lord be with you. And the second sentence out of his mouth is, who is that? Well, that's my translation. But (laughs) whose woman is she? Notice he says whose. He's asking who does she belong to? What family, clan, tribe? And what's the truth about Ruth? She doesn't have one. She doesn't have a people. She inquires. And the foreman answers, essentially, she's a Moabite woman from Moab. She's not one of us. She's not from here. But then he goes on and says, but we can't get rid of her. She's been here all day working. She has to glean, and she won't leave. She was working her tail off, but for one little rest. It's like she's from Moab, and we don't really know, but we can't get her to leave. She just stays here and works all day. 
Ruth is showing us something really important here. And I want you to see this. God's provision in our lives is not magic. She's doing something. There's not a lot in her life up to this point that's been, you could call, blessed. She lost her husband. She lost her, her family of origin. She lost her culture and her land. She has a bitter mother-in-law, an older woman at home. That's what she's, all she's got. She's so poor, she has to gather the scraps. But she hasn't quit. She's seeking favor. This is not the same thing of, of, as what Ben Franklin proverbially, proverbially said, God helps those who help themselves, which is not in the Bible and not true. Because actually the Bible says God helps the helpless. God helps those who can't help themselves. But it is showing us a picture of what James' version of faith in the New Testament. Faith is not just let go and let God. Sit back here with Naomi and hope somebody knocks at the door. And my knight in shining armor shows up. Something, hope something good happens. People will say, when God closes the door, he opens a window. I don't know what that means, right? <laughs> she says, I'm going to go seek favor. I'm going to go seek favor. I'm trusting that God somehow, because she is helpless. Without someone who would show her favor, she can't control her destiny. She can't make it happen. But she's not passive either. God's provision in our lives is not magic. Spiritually speaking, we're all helpless. We're all seeking favor, and we depend on the God who helps us. Let's read verses 8 through 10 of the chapter. I don't know. Dee, did I just, am I just going long, or is this clock messed up? Somebody playing tricks on me. <laughs> then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close. By the way, that, word, that phrase, keep close, or your Bible might say stay here, same Hebrew word. Debak, which means cling, clung to, when Ruth clung to Naomi, when a man will cleave or cling to his, his wife. Same word, stay here, cling to this place, to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? There's so much going on in here. I will have to go quickly. This is quite the Old Testament pickup line, isn't it, for, Bo for Boaz? Who is that? Stay here in my field, right? And don't go anywhere, right? In verse 9, he says, drink what the young men have, draw, have drawn for you. This is shocking. It's easy for us to miss. In the ancient world, men drank the water the women drew. Here you have an Israelite man who's important in the community telling a foreign Moabite woman, drink what the men have drawn. That's like, that's crazy. That's shocking. Boaz, is, and we'll see this later in the story next week and the weeks after, is going far beyond what the law requires of him. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Unmerited favor. Ruth has found the favor. She says, right in verse 10, why have you shown favor to me? It's what she was seeking. This brings the last point, the favor of God. Remember that split screen analogy, right? On one side we have the favor that we experience when people are kind to us and when we're, they experience when we're kind to them. The other part of that screen is that that is the favor of God. How does God show favor to you? How does God show kindness to you? How? Most often through people, through relationships, through acts of kindness. To Naomi, through the kindness and faithfulness of Ruth, to Ruth, through the obedience and kindness of Boaz. And we'll see to Boaz through Ruth as well. Let me read the last couple of verses here, verse 11 and through 13. These, these are the, not only the crux of this passage, but really of the entire book, in my opinion. But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since your de the death of your husband has been fully told to me. It means I know about your character, Ruth. I know what kind of a woman you are. And how you left your father and mother in your native land, he came to a people you did not know before. That sounds like Abraham, right? He went to a land which he did not know. A step of faith, the father of faith. The Lord repay you for what you have done. And a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. 
Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. She recognizes, I don't deserve this. You don't owe me this. This is way above and beyond. The passage makes the connection between the favor of God and the kindness and grace that we give and receive. I think verse 12 is the key verse. Boaz is showing Ruth, the favor you sought and have found in my act of kindness is the favor of God, Yahweh. And the truth is, every one of us is seeking the favor of God. And this phrase of the under his wings, we come to take refuge. I love this. This is a pervasive theme throughout. Read the Psalms. It's all over the Psalms. Psalm 36, verse 7. How precious is your loving kindness, O God, and the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 91, verse 4, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Psalm 17, keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 63, verse 7, for you've been my help and my shield, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Over and over again, the psalmist in the Old Testament uses this image of a bird's wings, and the place that we find God's favor and rest and protection and blessing is under his wings. As close, to, even Jesus says, right, to, to Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, I have longed to gather you as a hen gathers chicks. Bring you in close. But you would not have it. This is the place of favor that every one of us seeks. Ruth is seeking favor and she finds it in the person of Boaz. Boaz, a man who treats the foreigner as his family, he calls her daughter. Boaz, the man who shelters the weak under his wings, my men won't touch you. Boaz, the man who feeds the hungry from his own fields and table and showers the poor widow with his grace. Every one of us seeks and finds the favor of God in the person of Jesus Christ. The favor Ruth finds is in a person, and that person, Boaz, is a signpost pointing us to the one in whom, the person in whom we find favor. Jesus who treats the foreigner as family, adopts us as sons and daughters. Jesus, who feeds us at his table, where we'll be in a moment. Jesus, who brings us under the shadow of his wings to protect us by his grace and pours out his grace on us. The theme of the whole Bible and the gospel and certainly of the book of Ruth is not just an interesting ancient love story between this foreign widow and this rich Israelite man. It's saying the favor you seek in your life is the favor of God. And as Ruth finds it in the person Boaz, so ultimately you and I find it in the person of Jesus Christ. It's always a perfect fitting ending, but we're going to close by coming to the Lord's table. The place where he welcomes you who are foreigners and strangers as sons and daughters, where he lavishes his grace on you. And as the elements come to you, I want you to see this as an act of God bringing you under the protection of his wings of grace, refuge in his loving care. Let's bow. Father God, you have poured out your grace on us that which we are not deserving of. You have gone far beyond what we could ask or imagine and certainly what we deserve. You poured out your life for our sake. You became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You emptied yourself so that we who are poor and helpless could find refuge in salvation. Remind us as we come now through bread and cup to remember the depth of your sacrifice and the depth of your love. Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.